Hello, I'm Dr. Lewis Hoffman of Saybrook University, and this is a very brief introduction to existential psychology that is being presented in this video lecture. It is being developed as part of a class on the foundations of existential humanistic and transpersonal psychology at Saybrook University, uh, but is being placed in an open access format for others who may be interested as well. I want to really emphasize that this is a brief introduction. I'm going to be focusing on some very broad strokes that will provide some context for understanding existential, existential psychology and going more deeply into it. But in, uh, with this being a short lecture, there's really not the ability to go into great depth uh, as existential psychology really is a, a quite broad uh, topic and there's a lot of depth and nuances into a lot of the ideas that are are brought up within existential psychology. So this really is to help uh, people provide a framework into existential psychology and the different approaches to existential psychology. So this is going to be the, the charts of what I'm going to go through today. I'll talk briefly about the origins of existential thought, uh, existential philosophy and existential psychology, the origins of existential psychology, the existential psychology mosaic, the religion debate within existential psychology, or I shouldn't say as much within existential psychology as uh, what people project upon existential psychology. Uh, and then I'll go through the different schools of existential thought very briefly, just pointing to uh, some highlights and the important figures. And then I will talk briefly about contemporary themes in existential psychology. So if we look at the origins of existential thought, most people will identify Kierkegaard as the originator of what has been, become known as existential psychology. But in calling him the originator, it's not intended in a confining way. He was more the, the first voice that was that is most often identified as being representative of an existential perspective. However, I don't think anyone would argue that existential thought is uh, primarily derivative from Kierkegaard. There are some others that will say that Pascal or Nietzsche or, or Sartre or even Socrates is the true originator of existential thought. I think Socrates certainly is a stretch, even though uh, I would say that it did talk about some existential themes, but uh, as far as really falling in within what we talk about as existential today, I, I don't think I would place him there. Uh, I would uh, agree with the appraisal that Kierkegaard really makes sense as the uh, the person to be seen as the, the originator, but it would again want to emphasize I would not want that to be understood in a confining way. It's good to be familiar with some of the other important figures, philosophical figures, and particularly because as we'll talk about in a second, there's a connection between existential philosophy and existential psychology. So some of the other important names are Carl Jaspers, Martin Buber, who is both a philosopher and and theologian, a Jewish theologian who is very influential, and there's even approaches to therapy developed off of Buber's work, particularly around his I Thou and his uh, relational understandings. Uh, Paul Tillich uh, was also a philosopher and theologian, very influential on Rollo May, who's often considered uh, the, the first person to really develop an existential psychology approach in the United States, a un particularly unique existential psychology approach in the United States. Gabriel Marcel, uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, Albert Camus, who is known both as a literary figure and, and a philosopher, and I think in some ways Kafka as a literary figure often is uh, put in there as well, but not uh, thought of as much as a philosopher. And Robert Solomon is uh, more of a contemporary figure. Uh, he wouldn't get identified as much because a lot of his work was around some of these other thinkers, more so than contributing uh, his own new thinking. But he was a, a very strong voice in existential uh, philosophy and uh, teaching about it for some time in the United States. Now, if we think about the origins of existential thought and, and the label existential, the label was not really applied until the 1940s. And I think this is really important, that there had been a lot of writing that is now considered existential that went on before uh, the label was ever applied to it. And when I say a lot of existential thought had been going on, by people that are now considered existentialists and people that would not be considered existentialists. So there is um, a lot of thought that is going on that is relevant to the development of existential thought uh, prior to the label coming about. Uh, 
why I think this is important is because it once again points to that existential thought can't be just narrowly defined around any particular figure or any particular moment. It was different thoughts that occurred in different places that, that seemed to resonate with each other and come, they came together and, and this is what we start to identify as existential school. And so the existential school of thought is broad and inclusive in that way. So it did not, it did not derive from the singular source. This, I think, is an important strength of the approach, and part of why it is hard to turn any existential approach into a rigid orthodoxy, which is often seen in some other approaches. Now, there, there certainly are examples of where that's been done in existential psychology. It's, it's not free from this problem by any means, but I think many people that identify with the existential movement even struggle with the idea of calling it existential or, or labeling themselves an existential thinker or existential psychologist because in some way this idea of placing a label on it uh, seems to run contrary to existential thought. Now it also um, provides some challenges because you'll see sometimes people will say well isn't really all psychology existential or I've seen this applied to music and movies too that aren't really all music and movies existential? Well I think this is a uh, going a little bit too loose. We, that existential thought is um, flexible and adaptive, but there are some ideas that are, are connected with it in ways, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, that make it existential. So there's no litmus test, and I would say that it's best understood as a mosaic. And what I mean by this is if you think of all these different ideas that could be placed out there as part of existential thought, people that identify as existential, they will tend to look at these different options and say, yeah, I agree with most of those. Maybe not all of them, but it comes down to the different kind of a mixture or brew of existential thought. Then, And each brew is going to be different, so um, you're not going to see all of the different existential psychologists saying this is these are the essential things and and that's okay and I, I I personally prefer it that way as opposed to saying that there's a litmus test and you have to agree with this 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 and this in order to really truly be existential so I think this again uh, I want to re-emphasize this over and over that I think this is a strength and a good thing now, even if people could agree upon the same different factors that are part of existential psychology, I'm quite certain that you would find that they don't fully agree upon what that means. Again, this is one of the strengths, that there's a similarity. There's things that do bring us together. It's not that everything is existential. It's not not all movies are existential. Not all music are, are existential. Not all philosophies or psychologies are existential. There is something that holds us together, but it's not um, a series of ideas that everyone has to subscribe to, but instead a cluster of ideas in which people that identify as existential tend to agree with most of those, but not all of them, in a different mixture for different people that identify with this existential movement. I'll come back to that mosaic here in a, in a little bit, but let me talk first about existential psychology and existential philosophy. Now, there are other approaches to psychology that grew heavily out of philosophical movements. Many of them have strayed a little further away from the philosophical roots. Existential psychology certainly has stayed closely in connection with philosophy. But I, I think it's important that we clarify that it is not a philosophical approach. It's not, a, it's not philosophical therapy, for example. There is um, a philosophical therapy movement out there. That's not what existential psychology is, and it shouldn't be reduced to this. And when you look at for example, existential psychotherapy, it's a very practical approach. It's not uh, a very heady approach. So when I've taught courses on existential psychotherapy, for example, I've had students say, you know, I'm interested in this because I'm interested in the things you said about, about psychotherapy and resonate with that, but I don't really want to read uh, Kierkegaard or Sartre or 
are Nietzsche? And do I have to learn these different thinkers in order to learn existential therapy? No, you don't. It's not, not something where it is just about the philosophy. And when you look at the applied psychotherapy, um, it's, it's a very relational approach, I would say. Again, there's different schools of thought. Some are going to be more philosophical than others. But it, by and large, it's a very relational approach. And it can be a very practical approach. And so you don't need to be able to read Heidegger or Kierkegaard or any of these people in order to uh, be an existential psychologist. However, I think there are some things that uh, as a existential practitioner, whether that is a therapist or in some other way, where being engaged with philosophy can uh, sharpen your thinking and your skills and the way that you see the world. So the philosophy uh, certainly does have some connections, but existential psychology should not be reduced to existential philosophy. There are ways that it, it disagrees with it. Now, there are some within existential psychology that will take a little bit of a different take and place of philosopher more central. This is most common with uh, Heidegger. And there are some within existential psychology that really see uh, Heidegger kind of as that litmus test that you would uh, pretty much argue you need to be able to understand Heidegger and apply some of his ideas in order to, to be in this existential movement. Uh, I, I disagree with that. I think there's certainly a place for approaches that are more closely tied to Heidegger, but I would not uh, by any means want to advocate that you that existential psychology as a whole needs, should be tied to any one philosopher. I think our, our diversity within existential psychology is a strength, the diversity of thought and diversity of approaches to existential psychology. And less frequently you might see someone that ties closely to Sartre to Nietzsche, but uh, normally when someone ties closely to a philosopher, it's going to be Heidegger. When you think of the origin of existential psychology, then, it began in Europe. Ludwig Binswager was the first to develop an existential approach to psychology. But Binswager, while certainly was influential, he was not as influential as other originators. And, you know, again, I think this is part of that uh, the way that existential psychology came about is that there there were a number of different approaches to existential psychology, like there's a number of different approaches to existential philosophy that seemed to kind of develop around the same time, uh, but fairly independently, and then came together to be associated with this. So, Ben Zweigers was called an existential approach, so, it's, so he's the originator in that sense, and he was influential in that uh, did influence some of the other early uh, existential psychology figures, but um, it was not in a limiting way so much. Menard Boss was maybe more uh, influential in a lot of ways in the development of existential analysis in Europe, and this has had um, some significant influence uh, in Europe as well as upon some people in the United States, uh, maybe most notably Eric Craig, who is an important United States existential psychologist that uh, did a lot of training with uh, Boss and was highly influenced by, by Boss in many ways. Now in the United States, Rollo May is generally considered to be uh, the, the person that first brought existential psychology and developed it in the United States. Uh, a lot of times, the, the kind of the, the beginning of this movement, even though May had written and published before this and had done, done some things a lot that certainly are, are consistent with his later existential approach prior to this, 1958 and the publication of the book Existence, which was an edited book by uh, Rolla May and some colleagues. This is really seen as the beginning of existential psychology in the United States by May, as well as the beginning of a unique uh, American approach to existential psychology, which would be one of the schools of thought that we'll talk about later. Now, in this book, May did include a number of of uh, translations of Ben Zwanger's work. So here again, we do see the influence of Ben Zwanger, but we also see May putting down some of his initial formulations on what is existential psychology and existential psychotherapy in the United States. Um, so May developed his own approach that drew upon earlier European existential approaches, but did have a unique existential flavor in many ways too. Uh, what is this existential mosaic that I talked about? These are some of the things. I don't know that they that it's a, a fully inclusive list. I'm sure some others would add ideas. 
the, to this existential mosaic, which I, I would welcome, and I think that's good. But these are some of the, the things that I would say are a big part of the, the mosaic. There's an interest around this question of what does it mean to exist? So really looking and, and examining um, the idea of existence. I think this is, is key. The idea of subjectivity uh, is, uh, and the lived experience. And some might uh, collapse subjectivity and lived experience into one thing. Uh, they could be looked at as separate. Um, the subjectivity is really looking at one's own subjective perspective. It's really focused on individual's perspective. And this is where, at times, existential psychology has become very individualistic, although uh, I think it is unfairly sometimes characterized as being um, an extreme individualistic approach. Certainly, it, it has not evolved in a way that uh, would, would still always be an extreme individualist approach, but I think there certainly um, have been times where existential psychology has been problematically too individualistic. Uh, but I think there's some correctives that have come to this, and I, and I think sometimes there have been some misunderstanding about existential psychology and the individualistic perspective that have led to misperceptions about this. Um, the lived experience, uh, and this is some of the phenomenological influence, some of the influence of Heidegger and others, is really looking at, at the, a person's lived experience. So it's definitely connected to this idea of subjectivity, but I think there can be some distinctions made as well. The existential givens. Uh, are generally seen as an important part. And these are described and talked about differently. Yalom's is probably the most well-known of the different uh, formulations of the existential givens. Uh, but, you know, it, it's interesting. It's, mo it's the most well-known. It's probably cited the most often by people outside of existential psychology. But many people within existential psychology struggle with Yalom's characterization for a couple of reasons. One could be because of the, uh, the four themes that uh, the foreign themes are maybe not um, inclusive enough, but also that they're, the way that the givens are written in Yalom's perspective, there's a very negative side to it. Uh, he talks about them in, in more in the sense of, the, of the, the challenge. And Tom Greening, for example, has um, contrasted with this of looking at the givens having a challenge and an opportunity. I, I would agree with Greening and others and think that it's better to conceptualize these broader and seeing them as having both difficult or challenging aspects to them, but also opportunities with them. There's different perspectives, too, about how we should face the givens, and, and we could go on and on about these. But the existential givens, uh, there are five that could really be seen as the, the most commonly referred to, and again, with different language. Finitude or death would be one of them. Yalom used death. I think finitude is better because it's broad and more inclusive. Uh, finitude includes the idea of our, our physical death, but also human limitation. And so human limitation, the idea of not knowing, the, the mysteries of life, all of this comes in there. Our, our hu just the limitations inherent in being human, that we can only know so much, that we can only be so connected with others. So this is really a, a broad and central one. And certainly, literal death is an important aspect of this, but I think when we talk about death, we also need to think about all the symbolic deaths, which are represented in finitude and all of human limitation. So finitude, death, human limitation, this could be our, our first of the existential givens. And then freedom and responsibility, and these need to be connected together. Rollo May talked about this as freedom and destiny, uh, with freedom being our ability to, to act, to live as free agents, and destiny being these things that uh, impinge upon us. But then when we th within that, we also got to connect in this idea of responsibility. Frankel once famously said, you know, it's great that, you, that the United States has the Statue of Liberty on one coast. They need to balance it with the Statue of Responsibility on the other coast. Uh, and Yalom really develops this idea, too, that, that freedom and responsibility, they're, they're inherently connected. But one of the primary pathologies, we could say, that some people have is the desire to have freedom without responsibility. Uh, I think this is something very common that we find in the United States in particular. So this could be the second given, is that freedom, destiny, responsibility. 
uh, agency could be another word that we put in there with this given. A third given is a relationship or isolation. Again, uh, Yalom's going to really focus on the loneliness, the isolation, the limits in our ability to connect, to know others, to be known, the limits to intimacy. Well, this is an aspect of, to it, of it. There's also, I think, the reality that we are relational beings and that relationships often have the deepest meaning in our lives. And my personal bias as an existential um, psychologist is that meaning is the most central, or that relationship is the most central uh, form of meaning that we can experience. Uh, so it's really pivotal. Uh, so and also there's this idea within this as a given that we are inherently meaning cre meaning seek or uh, sorry we're inherently uh, relational as human beings. So this is our our third given is around relationships and the limitations uh, in relationships that are connected with isolation and loneliness. A fourth given is meaning. Uh, Yalom talked about this as meaninglessness. So again, he's focusing on that negative aspect of it and that life has a meaningless aspect to it. But uh, others will talk about a much more positive. Frankel and Paul Wong and others uh, see meaning as more of the positive aspect of it. That we are meaning-seeking creatures and there's some potential for meaning in our obtaining meaning in our lives. Uh, so again, this is an inherent thing. This is a, a given of existence. And then... Uh, the, a fifth one that Yalom doesn't talk about, but Bugenthal does, would be experience or emotion. That we are, we are emotional creatures, we are experiential creatures, and this is a valid way of knowing. And uh, I think part of what putting this in as a, a given does too is that it helps us to reclaim all the different emotions as potentially healthy. That in so much of the field of psychology, we kind of separate out, this is a good emotion, this is a negative emotion, and yeah, maybe we can use these negative emotions in some ways, but mostly we cope with them, we deal with them, we survive them. And an existential approach really tends to look at it differently, that all of our emotions are valuable, and all of them can even, uh, when we put them in this broader experience, can have some positive aspects to them. Um, so it's not to glorify things like suffering or pain in any way, but we can transition, we can transform the way that we experience a lot of these things over time. And so all emotions are, are valuable and experience is, is valuable. And uh, this also points to the experiential level of change, I think, uh, going beyond just a cognitive level or just a behavioral level or just a biological level, that there's this experiential level, that uh, subjective level that is, is really important. So the idea with these givens then in the mosaic is that these are things that everyone will experience, but there's not necessarily one universal answer to them. And uh, one of the things that, that I've really argued over time and, and written about is that when we look at the, the responses to the given, there it's a mixture of an individual and a cultural response that is given. And so we need to, here's a place where we really need to consider culture and, and multiculturalism and diversity is around these givens in response to them. So an appreciation for the givens, this is a, one of the, uh, the things in the, the mosaic, although it's understood in many different ways. There tends to be a, a focus within existential psychology on depth or self-awareness, and this can be in a couple of ways. Um, it can be focused on the unconscious or uh, a lot of times you'll see existential thinkers talk about the subconscious. And there's a reason for this, that um, they will argue that the unconscious, the idea of the unconscious seems to suggest that it's a separate consciousness instead of all one consciousness. And so the idea of a subconscious, using that language instead, emphasizes the idea that all of our consciousness is united. It's more of a holistic perspective. But there may be aspects of our consciousness that we're not... Uh, as aware of or always aware of or that fall out of our awareness. It's not an unconscious and being a different consciousness, but it is an aspect of our consciousness that we are not as aware of or in touch with. So, the, you know, there's a lot more complexity, a lot of debate around how we view the subconscious, unconscious, what language to use. But as we connect it in here as well, in the mosaic, it's the idea that, that uh, self-awareness and self-growth are important aspects of being human. And then the potential for good and potential for, for evil. And there's various ways of understanding 
of the potential good and the potential for evil. Um, the psychology of evil has been a strong interest of mine that I've done some writing about and, and looking at this from an existential perspective, uh, drawing upon a, a, a number of different theories. I tend to integrate a bit of a the ideas of Rolla May, Ernest Becker, who is an important existential anthropologist and philosopher, and then also some social psychology perspectives in there. But existential approaches tend to emphasize that it is important to, to consider the potential for evil, um, as well as the potential for good. And this is one of the places where humanistic and existential are sometimes distinguished. Uh, and Rolla May and Carl Rogers had a a very famous debate about this in the literature. It wasn't a very in-depth debate, unfortunately. It would have been great to see them go into it a little bit more in ways, um, but it, it looked at this difference about balancing this human potential that was emphasized a lot in humanistic psychology with this potential for evil. And I think within humanistic psychology, we do often also see this uh, place for, for evil and human limitation put in there, but it's, it's done more explicitly a lot of times within existential approaches. In the end of Rollo May's life, it's one of the reasons why he felt more comfortable identifying as existential instead of humanistic, it was largely connected around this, this idea of evil. And I, I deeply resonate with that, that I, I do feel comfortable both identifying as a humanistic psychologist or an existential psychologist, but I, I, I tend to resonate close, more closely with existential, partially because these are the writers that have, in, and theorists and practitioners who have had the biggest influence on me, but also partially around this, uh, these distinctions around the idea of evil. Okay, the religion debate. Uh, having taught existential psychology for about 10 years now, I find one of the most intriguing things that I find, and most of the time, I've, uh, most of my career I've taught outside of humanistic institutions where there was, uh, most people didn't have a, a lot of understanding about humanistic and existential psychology. But I would find it was very common for people to come up and say, oh yeah, I, I like existential psychology uh, because it's a religious approach, or I don't like existential psychology because it's, it's too much of a religious approach. And then others would come up to me and say, uh, you know, I, I just can't uh, stomach existential psychology because it's so anti-religion and atheistic. Or... Um, or I'm drawn to existential psychology because of it being more atheistic or against religion, and I don't think religion's a good thing. So you get these drastically different perspectives on existential psychology and its relationship with religion that I, I find to be rather amusing. And uh, people will make these pronouncements about existential psychology with great convention, conviction. Um, but I think in reality, uh, it, it varies from philosopher to philosopher and psychologist to psychologist. That if you look at... Um, Nietzsche and, and uh, Sartre, certainly, yeah, they were more uh, pessimistic about religion. Although I think, uh, particularly with Nietzsche, that, that often is misunderstood uh, in various ways. And if you look within psychology, certainly uh, you're going to see that uh, Yalom was, was quite negative about religion. So if you focus on uh, Nietzsche, Sartre, and, and Yalom, yeah, you get a perspective that existential philosophy and psychology are, are pretty hard on religion, pretty anti-religion. However, when you think back to Kierkegaard as being the or originator, Kierkegaard was a, um, a Lutheran minister. So he was, he was a Christian philosopher and theologian uh, that, was, that was identified as the originator. Martin Buber and Paul Tillich are, are both theologians that developed existential theologies. And so there, there is uh, certainly a connection with uh, religion within the existential approach as well. When you step back and look at across the existential psychology, it's not a religious or an anti-religious approach, but you have individuals and, and schools within existential thought that are going to be more prone towards being anti-religious or identifying with a religion, religious perspective. And really, this is true within many schools of thought and philosophy and psychology, but for some reason, there's a little bit more confusion about it. Let me give um, an example of this. It's, I think part of the problem is the misrepresentation. And because a lot of people that, that write these general texts don't really understand or identify with existential psychology, I think this is part of what brings in the, the misunderstandings. But 
uh, as a prominent example, let me talk a bit about an article that was written in 2009 by Jeremy Bartz that was a theistic existential psychotherapy. And Dan Helminiak, uh, another colleague, and I wrote a response to this article uh, that was published in the Humanistic Psychologist. But Bartz's original article was in the first issue of a new journal published by Division 36, which is the Religion and Spirituality Division of the American Psychological Association. His article drastically uh, misrepresents existential psychology, and I, I was just shocked that it made it through the peer review process. I was less frustrated with Bart's than I was with the peer review process, to be, to be honest, when I read this article. When I saw it come out, I was very intrigued by it and um, read it quickly after it came out. Uh, but was quite disappointed and frustrated after reading it because of the number of just factual problems about existential psychology. Now, in in fairness to Barth, he, he did say at the beginning that he was drawing largely upon, upon Yala. However, his generalizations about existential psychology go well beyond Yala, and they were frequently inaccurate as far as their um, approaches to understanding of philosophy and their um, understandings of existential psychology. And I think it's quite noteworthy that um, the only publication in existential psychology that was cited after 1980 was Yalom and Frankel, based on work of Frankel's that was really done uh, primarily before 1980. So this came out in 2009. There have been 29 years of existential psychology that was just ignored including many things that, that looked very directly at uh, existential psychology and religion. But it made it through the peer review process. So this un misunderstanding is broad enough that even in our peer review system, we don't catch these errors. You know, Bartz developed this as, uh, you know, in his mind, I think it was really based off of Yalom. But the article was not written to really suggest that. That's what should have been caught in the peer review process. And Bart should have gone back to, eat, to clarify and to, to really make sure it is connected to, to Yalom's ideas and to, to make it a clear distinction that it is not applying this to all the existential approaches. Had I done that, the article would have, I, I still would have disagreed with the aspect of it, but I would have thought it, it was an article that could have justifiably made it through the peer review process. However, as it is, um, it just really, in very, very problematic ways, um, presents a misunderstanding of existential psychology that, again, a lot of the people that are going to be reading this journal are not necessarily going to identify with existential psychology, and they're going to get a wrong impression of it. So I, I think it's, um, it's unfortunate that this uh, misperception continues out there in, in the debate. And as I said at the beginning, I would really say that the debate is not so much within existential psychology. My sense is within existential psychology, we're pretty comfortable with the differences, that there's some that uh, are, will take more of an atheistic approach and others that uh, really see religion and spirituality as quite central and valuable. That seems to be okay within, with people within the existential psychology movement. But many people outside looking in, it's a big concern, a big problem, and they project a lot upon existential psychology that is inaccurate. When we talk about the schools of existential psychology, um, there's one book um, by Mick Cooper, uh, Existential Psychotherapies, that does a, a real nice job of talking about the different schools of existential therapy. The only limitation with this book is it is uh, now over 10 years old and uh, in need of being updated. Um, I had the opportunity of talking with Mick a little bit at the American Psychological Association convention last year where he did receive a, a mid-career award from the uh, Society of Humanistic Psychology for his work. Um, and he is uh, in process of starting to update this book. Uh, it's going to wait until after the World Congress of Existential Psychotherapy that's happening next summer, but then is hoping to, to, to update this book, which I think will be uh, an important uh, update. It's, it's a very solid book as it stands, but uh, I think the update will be important because a lot's happened in the last uh, 11 years since this book has come out. He identified five major schools. You could maybe argue six if you count the brief 
uh, therapy derivatives as, as separate schools. I'll also discuss a couple of others. And again, just going to discuss these in, in brief. If you're interested in knowing some more about them, I would really encourage you to, to look at Cooper's book. It's a nice start and it'll point you to some of the, um, the important theorists, although I'll, I'll mention some names with uh, the different theories as, as we go through as well. So here's a snapshot of what I would have as, as eight schools. So it's a little bit different than um, Cooper's, but the, the first six listed on here are basically right, well, they are right from Cooper, and then seven and eight I'll talk a little bit about as, as being uh, somewhat dif different. So the Dyson analysis, um, Benzwinger and Boss, are the early figures here, as we talked about earlier, and one of the in particularly in the United States, one of the contemporary representatives of this is Eric Craig. Eric Craig studied quite a bit with Menard Boss, um, and so he's one of the, the primary contemporary voices uh, in Dyson analysis in the United States. Logotherapy, many people are familiar with uh, as something that has derived from uh, Paul from Victor Frankl's work, and do um, just point out, I, I do have a, a misspelling in Dyson analysis up there, so I apologize for, for that. Um, logotherapy is a approach developed by Victor Frankl. Uh, it's one that many people uh, are familiar with, at least to some degree, and logotherapy really is meaning therapy, and Paul Wong is one of the important contemporary figures, and he'll also talk about meaning-centered therapy, which uh, could be seen as a derivative of logotherapy in, in some ways. So this is a very important and influential s school. The, the logotherapy focuses a little bit more on some of the cognitive aspects, a little less on some of the experiential um, aspects of it, uh, which allows it to be a little bit more adaptable in certain ways, but also could be criticized as a limitation in some ways. There's the existential humanistic approach, which uh, is most closely associated with May and Jim Bugenthal as the originators of this. And May and Jim Bugenthal were also two of the founders of Saybrook University. So this existential humanistic approach has very deep ties with uh, Saybrook University. Schneider is maybe one of the most important contemporary voices in the existential humanistic approach. Uh, the existential humanistic approach is the approach that I personally uh, identify most closely with. Um, May and, and Bugenthal have both been very influential upon me. May, in particular, uh, has been quite influential upon me with a lot of his theory. And uh, Jim Bugenthal is, I think, one of the master clinicians that really represents this perspective. Uh, existential humanistic approach also has been quite influenced by Ernest Becker, who is not a psychologist, but uh, someone that uh, has influenced a lot of the, the contemporary figures in existential humanistic psychology. Now, there is a question that could address here about where to put Yalom. Yalom is uh, the best known existential psychologist in the world, uh, probably without much doubt. But where he really fits in is um, somewhat hard to say. I would guess that most would probably put Yalom with this existential humanistic approach. However, there are a number that would say that Yalom is really not an, an existential psychologist. And if you read his uh, major work, Existential Psychotherapy, in there, he really will say it's not a standalone psychotherapy in his view. And because of this, some people say, while he does integrate a lot of existential ideas, he really utilizes more of a psychoanalytic or contemporary psychoanalytic style approach, integrating some other approaches, um, more so than an, an existential approach. So where Yalom fits in? Um, maybe here, I, I think he really kind of has his, uh, an integrative approach that uh, of these approaches listed here would align cl most closely with the existential humanistic approach, but it's, it's really his own approach that is uh, an integrative approach of, of uh, some of the psychoanalytic theories and existential uh, approach. At least that would be my appraisal of it. Artie Lang uh, developed approach, and he, he's known... Uh, particularly for working with a lot of individuals with psychotic disorders. And so um, some would say that it, the, the broadness of, uh, of his approach is a little more uh, limiting. It's not quite, or I shouldn't say it's not quite as broad um, because of this. But Artie Lang, there, there are people that will uh, 
um, based their therapy largely off of his work. Um, there's a British school of existential analysis that uh, is most closely tied with Emmy Van Derzen. And this has become a very popular and very influential school. Uh, Emmy Van Derzen's uh, books have been uh, quite popular and widely read, widely translated. Uh, she is the, the person primarily responsible for starting uh, the movement towards organizing the World Congress of Existential Psychotherapy, which will be the first World Congress of Existential Psychotherapy. It's going to be held in uh, London in 2015 and bringing people together from these different schools. So it's really, uh, that's going to be an important contribution. Um, her approach, as Cooper characterized it, is more of a philosophical approach in some ways. So you know, I mentioned some of the approaches are more closely tied to philosophy, and and uh, Cooper certainly would say that Van Derzen is, is more closely tied to the philosophic approach. Now, the brief therapies, I don't know that these are so much a standalone uh, approach. Strasser and Strasser's maybe could be seen as a as a standalone brief therapy. Bugenthal, who um, Cooper talks about, is developing a brief approach. Um, Bugenthal was the playing with it. He developed some initial formulations about it, but you can tell in reading these initial formulations he wasn't sold. And, and really what he was trying to do is adapt a longer-term psychotherapy to something that could um, be used in uh, in the context of managed care and limitations that were placed on managed care. Then there's the existential phenomenological approach that uh, I think some would say that this really uh, could fall under a couple different places and it's not really distinct. And I think there's a fair argument for that. But um, because I, I worry that some of the work that has come out of what I'm referring to here as existential phenomenological psychology has been neglected, I wanted to put it as something separate to, to highlight the importance of, of this contribution. This could be tied some to the work of Amadeo Giorgi, although certainly not exclusively there. Um, I think Eric Craig has been an important voice. Spinelli could be placed in a couple different places, but I think could be really represent this approach as well. Todd DuBose of the Chicago School, and I uh, apologize, there's another typo, I listed uh, DuBose twice there. Um, but uh, but he is a strong voice, so maybe it's uh, it's uh, appropriate to list him twice there. Um, but this existential phenomenological approach was has historically been closely tied with uh, Duquesne University, which is where a lot of this is has developed. And so the existential phenomenological psychology, Amadeo Giorgi, developed a while at Duquesne, and, and then came and spent a lot of time in Saybrook University. So we can see with this that. There really are two of these schools of thought that have very close connections with Saybrook University. Although my, my hope is that increasingly Saybrook really tries to have representation from the different perspectives within uh, the existential psychology movement. And then last, um, there may be some others of these that will be identified over time, but I would mention Jamian therapy, which is an approach that was developed by Shuifu Wang in China. Uh, was based primarily off of the writings of Lushin, who was a literary figure, uh, and also uh, I think it could be said that he's a an essayist or a, a philosopher in different ways, um, though he is most known as a kind of a literary figure for some of his fiction. But he he was a influential figure in China in the early 1900s. And Shui Fu Wang developed an approach to therapy based off of this. After he developed an approach to therapy, and I should mention that Lushin was influenced by Nietzsche as well as some others, um, but certainly was not just uh, um, advocating for Nietzsche's perspective. So this couldn't be seen as a therapy derived from Nietzsche, I think, in, in any way, though I think there is certain influence and connection there. But after Shui Fu Wang developed this uh, perspective, uh, there was a colleague in, of his in China that read one of his books and contacted him and said, you know, what you're talking about is Jermian therapy sounds a lot like existential therapy. And this led to a number of um, developments and uh, Sui Fu and uh, Mark Ying and myself have been doing a lot of work in China around Jermian therapy and existential therapy and uh, I've started, come to see that Jermian therapy as an indigenous Chinese therapy 
existential therapy. Again, I think this goes back to how we talked about these labels at the beginning, that the thought began and the label came later. And I think this is uh, where Jermian fits in, is that it is uh, an existential approach in my view. It's not included in some books like Cooper's yet, in part because it hasn't uh, been articulated well enough in, in English. But it is, uh, I think, a, a valid approach that it could be considered existential. Um, right now, the, the dialogues with the existential and Jermian therapy are, are helping to both approaches, I think, to advance and develop in different ways. So these are the schools of existential thought. Let me very briefly um, mention some contemporary themes. I think I'm already going longer than what uh, I had planned with this. But it's hard when talking about something as exciting as ex existential psychology to keep it too brief, I guess. Um, contemporary themes. Saybrook University has always been one of the primary homes of existential thought, one of the most important schools. And so there became this perception a while back that existential psychology hasn't done anything new in a long time. And I, I've always thought that this was inaccurate. But when I first came to Saybrook, I started talking about this is a concern and that we really needed to rectify this. Um, one, by demonstrating that it's not accurate, that there are some very important and exciting new things that have been going on in existential psychology, but also by advocating that we need to continue to innovate and and dialogue with contemporary themes in psychology and uh, and continue to look at and do self-analysis of what existential psychology is. And so Saybrook began uh, this uh, new existentialist, which uh, Eugene Taylor, Kirk Schneider, Ed Mendowitz, myself, and a number of others were, uh, Tom Greening, were, were part of getting this uh, started. And it's intended as an inclusive forum representing ideas from different existential schools speaking to contemporary themes. Uh, there's been some misunderstanding that it's advocating that this is a new school or um, this is the only new school or something like that. That's never been the intention of the new existentialists at Saybrook. Rather, it's intended to, to be a place to highlight the, the new ideas and the new innovations in existential psychology and how it's applied, as well as how existential psychology is applied to contemporary themes across a variety of different perspectives on existential psychology. So you can go to the New Existentialist at Saybrook University, you just do a search in Google for it and it'll pop up and there's a weekly blog and I, if you search through there you'll see a lot of um, contemporary themes that existential psychology is wrestling with and a lot of things that are happening in the world that um, existential psychology perspectives are being tied to. I think one of the important things here too is uh, a limitation in what I've presented so far is that um, in talking about the different schools derived from, from Cooper, I've talked about it largely in psychotherapy, but I, I think it would be a uh, very sad and disconcerting if we limit these different schools of thought just to psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is where we've begun to articulate some of the differences and can see some of the differences, but all of these schools, I think, have tremendous uh, applicability and relevance beyond the psychotherapy room, and we need to continue to develop these approaches in the psychotherapy room, as well as looking more at how they apply outside of the psychotherapy room. This is one of those contemporary themes, is getting existential psychology beyond the therapy room. Some of this is the applications to political and social issues. Uh, Kirk Schneider is someone who's been doing uh, quite a bit of this with his um, experiential democracy, with his applications of awe um, to social issues, and most recently with the, what I think is an extremely important book, The Polarized Mind, in which he looks at the idea of polarization and how this is relevant to, to politics as well as other issues. He distinguishes polarization from extremism and, and saying that in extremism, while it can be problematic, it can be healthy, but polarization is focusing on one perspective with the other disregard to, uh, to other perspectives. So a very closed-minded approach, listening to one perspective and, and discounting the others. And certainly we can see a lot of that going on in the world today, a lot of that going on in politics today. So these political and social applications are, are, are very important. And I, there's a number of others of us that are looking at applications with peace psychology, with uh, um, 
diversity issues and, and a number of other social issues, which leads to this, this next issue here is I think there's a lot of exciting things going on with multiculturalism and existential psychology. One at the international level, but then also looking at uh, different types of, of diversity on, on other levels as well. For example, with the multiculturalism within the United States, uh, talking about uh, applying existential ideas to um, cultural diversity, to gender issues, to sexual orientation issues, to ability issues. So there's some very exciting things happening here. Existential psychology, along with humanistic psychology, has been a leader in and challenging the Diagnostic and Statistical, Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders of the American Psychiatric Association and in helping to build alternatives to it, which I think is, is very important. Spirituality, and I think this comes from a number of different perspectives, is um, really becoming an important theme, which and again shows that uh, the mischaracterization of it as an anti-religion or, or a perspective is, is really inaccurate. Schneider has talked about an awe-based approach to this. There's a number of others that uh, will write about how existential psychology can be applied to various religious issues or religious perspectives. So there's, there's a lot going on with spirituality and religion. Uh, terror management theory is an important new force within existential psychology. That this has um, really been an important movement. It came out of social psychology. It's derived from the work of Ernest Becker, who's an uh, incredibly important uh, existential thinker and terror management theory has uh, been a very um, has drawn a lot of attention from a research perspective and there's a lot of research that has been done uh, to support terror management theory it continues to to grow and evolve uh, as a theory uh, but is based largely off of some of the ideas about his work there's also moved towards integrative perspectives uh, schneider uh, published a book that was very important recently on, I guess it's a, a number of years ago now, but on existential integrative psychotherapy. And I think we can also think about the integrative and existential beyond just psychotherapy as well. And then there's also been some movement to look at um, common factors, research in psychotherapy and existential psychotherapy, as well as articulating the evidence-based foundations of existential psychology. Uh, Mick Cooper, once again, has uh, been doing some work on this in this area. Uh, I've been doing uh, some work in this area. Uh, Kevin Keenan, Sean Rubin, or others who have uh, uh, taken a look at this particular area. So there's, um, but this is an important thing so that we can try and get existential psychology, um, the evidence-based foundation of it that, that already exists, that we can um, help people understand this, which increases the applicability in the places that will support the use of existential therapy and then also it helps us find some of our weaknesses where we may need to change our approach or to do more research to examine and and get the basis that uh, the evidence basis that really supports the approach okay so this is the the brief introduction to existential psychology a little less brief than what i originally thought it might be but hopefully it can provide some of the contextual framework for understanding uh, existential psychology, the differences in it, the diversity in it, but also the uni unity and how we come together. And I, as a whole, I think existential psychology uh, does a nice job at being accepting of these different schools and different approaches. It's one of my big passions within existential psychology is that uh, I think it's very important that we, we do respect these differences and are in dialogue with each other. Um, I, not so much debate, at least in the way that we often see debates in the United States, because that can lead to this idea of trying to figure out which approach is best. Um, I think there's a place for, for things like critique and looking at, at it from a perspective of critique, but I think also we want to look at the constructive ways that we can be in dialogue and learn from each other and appreciate and value our differences, because all of these different uh, schools and perspectives have a very important voice and something to offer. That's the, uh, the end of the lecture. Thanks.